I'm um, my name's Lou and I'm from Core Mob up in Darwin and I'm very excited to be emceeing this session this afternoon. I tuned into the previous Edible Oasis session and it was thriving with so many questions and knowledge sharing so that's great to see. Um, so uh, today we've got Nightcliff, um, sorry we've got Lakeside Drive Community Garden and I've been told that they're running a little bit late due to a hold up. So um, we will flick to them when they join us in a couple of minutes, but we're also joined by Zakoli Organic, um, the Footprint Garden Farm and Permanora. And what I might get um, all of our panelists to do this afternoon is I'll flick to each of you one by one and maybe you could just spend a few minutes introducing your home and your garden um, so we can see who we're talking to this afternoon. Uh, so we might start with the first person I can see. Oh, so yeah, Lakeside Drive Community Garden, they're not actually on the call yet. So we might leave them and flick over to the next person. Um, so Coley Organic. Hi guys, it's Karen here. Can you hear me well? Good, yep. okay. Hi, um, hello and welcome to our sustainable urban home. Um, I am Karen Lau. Uh, we are the proud owner of our home business, Zakoli Organic, hence the name. Um, we live on the standard 750 meter square block in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. And since we moved here to about two years ago, we worked towards living as self-sustainably as possible and growing as much food as we can on site, on our own piece of land. Um, so when we first moved into this house, the soil on the site was extremely poor quality and it was basically pretty much water phobic and um, there's nothing that we could do to, there's nothing we could plant on the soil because we had, uh, there was nine months of construction on site and the soil was completely exposed. Um, and since we've moved here within three months, we ordered some free mulch. So when companies cut down trees, we got about six to about eight cubic meters of tree mulch and we, we, we tried to recover the soil by, by putting the mulch covering all across our garden. And this is the um, approach that we call it the no dig garden approach or the back to Eden approach. So if you haven't heard about back to Eden, it's, it's really worth looking into it. It's, it's just fascinating. So we use this approach um, to really recover our soil. So we cover up the whole garden with really, really thick mulch. And in, we have basically an instant garden bed. So we could immediately plant plant our food, um, plant our food in the, in the, um, in the mulch. So basically when we cover the, the garden with a mulch, we can have some opening and we apply some compost, we can have an instant garden bed by doing that. So, um, so we make sure that with the mulch we use is a tree mulch with leaves and the bark because having the leaf, it breaks down faster and you have different nutrient profile to the bark. So in the nine, short nine months, we were able to completely transform our barren front garden to a beautiful for food oasis. And, we're, and now our garden two years on uh, houses over 150 different food plants. So that's the soil restoration. The other part of our um, um, creating a beautiful food oasis is to raise some ducks. So we have six Kaki Campbell ducks that we raise in our front garden. We have a movable duck coop and which we move around the garden to try to fertilize the soil. And um, the ducks are amazing because the, the droppings are really, really great for the soil and it feeds the, the garden beds. They are also very useful scavengers for removing pests for our garden, like slugs and snails. Um, just need to make sure that you need to, for, for plants that they will eat, you just need to make sure you put a barrier around them. And to, to put a barrier for ducks is very easy. You just need a 60 centimeter height barrier and you will keep them away from your garden beds. Um, the, the last thing that we do for our garden is um, to grow our food is to build our own wicking bed. So in the new part of the house that we have, um, we, there is a part of the house under the eave that it doesn't have you doesn't catch any rainfall, so we can't grow anything there. So we decided to use this part of the house to um, build our own wicking beds, so there was no need for us to hand water them. Um, and then the, the, the wicking bed we have had water fed from the recycled water from our bathtub. So we went through quite a bit of um, um, exercise to have the bath water 
directed to our reef bed. So we have a reef bed first, which, which has stones and pebbles to filter the water. And, and we also grow some um, water plants in there and then have that overflow of the water from the reef bed feeding into our wicking bed. So there is no need for us to water the garden at all. And we make great use of that space um, for our wicking bed. So these are the three key things that we did for our garden to create our own food oasis. And if you can think creatively, um, there is always something that can be done to you for you to allow to grow your own food, even in urban places, even in small places, uh, spaces. So if you cannot keep dogs, you can keep quails, which is very easy to keep. They can give you eggs, they can give you droppings to, to, you know, to feed your plants. Wicking beds are also fantastic at growing food. You save you water and save you a lot of effort to, you know, to maintain them. And um, even existing beds can be convert, converted to a wicking bed uh, with a little bit of effort and minimal outlay. So saving resources, growing your own food is one of the best things we've done in the last two years we lived here. So that's thank it from me. You. Thank you, Karen. That's a great wrap up and super inspiring. Um, I can definitely say for anyone who's tuning in and looking to get started, particularly that you managed to do this in just nine short months to get your garden pumping. Um, yeah. And I forgot to say at the start, but um, for anyone tuning in, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of the Zoom screen um, to fire through any questions that I can put to the panelists and then use the chat button just to share resources and knowledge with each other rather than to get a question asked to the panelists. Um, I might pass over to our next house, which um, I'll wait for sustainable house data pull up the screen but if they don't um maybe i can call on the footprint garden garden farm hi everyone i'm jay and this is sue and this is footprint garden farm uh, which we designed and built about three years ago in uh, winlango just south of adelaide and uh, as you can see from our video and our Sustainable House Day profile page, we wanted a house and garden that would allow us to live as sustainably as we could in order to leave a smaller possible footprint on the earth for us and for future generations. And also to show that ordinary people could do this. Uh, we believe that part of sustainable living is growing as much of our own food on our small block as we can. So we maximise the area of our garden and it's become our edible oasis. And uh, we use organic and biodynamic methods and we aim to provide food for ourselves, our family and the neighbouring community. Uh, as part of our presentation preparation for this project, Sue studied and has her permaculture design certificate and knows far more about this than I. So to answer most of your questions, over to you, Sue. Hi everyone. Um, I'll just briefly uh, summarise um, what our garden is about and I would mm. really welcome lots of questions. So I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, the garden uh, is 450 square meters, and what we're aiming to, what I'm aiming to do, is to create a beautiful, productive oasis um, that combines edible, productive plants with beautiful flowering plants. And so we have got, we've got what. Um, over 50 fruit and nut trees planted in the three years we've been here. We've got 15 berry plants, plus lots of strawberries. We've got 12 vines, grape, grape vines, passion fruit vines, kiwi fruit vines. We have um, four summer wicking beds, uh, which we in which we grow our vegetables, and four winter beds, which are raised garden beds. We have compost heaps, worm farm, chooks, two chooks, and we, we have rainwater tanks and we water mainly by drip irrigation. Um, we also have a in ground beds with herbs and beneficial plants and some 
and native plants to help create biodiversity. So I think that's really all I can tell you at the moment, but please, if you've got any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you, Footprint Garden. That just looks so amazing and thriving. Um, next, we've got Permanora. If you could tell us um, a little bit about your place. Sorry, I have to unmute myself. Um, my name's Selena, and um, we've been at Permanora just about um, 10 years now. And when we started, we're in a 1,200 square metre block on the northern beaches of Sydney. So we have our own quite beautiful microclimate. We're fairly sheltered because we're in a gully. We've got a really, really good aspect and um, we the house is situated at the top. So all the water storage is at the top of the property um, and we've built a retention trench under the house. So we have um, 15,000 litres of water that we collect and then that goes into the trench, which is the width of the garden and it slowly trickles down into the garden. So we very rarely have to water. Um, the garden, I've used a lot of different um, techniques to uh, manage that water so that we have dry sections and wet sections. And so I've got all my Asian greens in the wetter sections. Um, I've got a whole subtropical native fruit forest um, in the shady corner of the garden. Uh, and I've got all my Mediterranean uh, um, sort of figs, citrus um, in the, the dry, more well-drained part of the garden with a lot more sun. We keep native bees and normal bees to help with pollination. And we've got a number of ponds. So you can see the inside of one of our native beehives here. Um, and over the 10 years I've learnt <laughs> Um, that you can desperately want to grow some things, but you've just got to work with the climate that you've got. So we, we use permaculture principles and um, uh, we use no pesticides. Um, we have chickens for natural pest control. Um, because we don't use any pesticides or rodenticides, we've um, got a really great ecosystem uh, going now. So we've got a couple of local diamond pythons have moved in. They do pest control for us. We've got a large range of different types of frogs um, that live in all the different ponds. Um, so we've got um, we've got no snails or slugs because the um, bandicoots and the kookaburras deal with those guys. So we're we're learning to live with um, what we've got. The Cockatoos have told us we're not allowed to have any apples. Um, they eat all of them. So um, I've recently taken out all of the, the fruit in the garden that needs to have a cold winter or the birds like or we get um, fruit fly. And I've relocated them to a friend's colder garden um, in the in a nearby. <laughs> um, and I've replaced in those sections a whole lot of native um, uh, plants that are food and medicine plants from um, Indigigro. And so, you know, we're growing constantly with the garden. We've recently had a whole pile of um, the local endangered tree ferns decide that they want to grow completely across our garden. And that's changed a number of the microclimates in the garden, but we've worked with that. And that's made a new spot in the garden um, that's really suitable for things like black sugar cane and a whole lot of South American um, tropical things like tomatilla so uh, we just go with the flow some things decide where they want to go and uh, so we let the garden in that whole permaculture thing we let the garden <laughs> design itself in essence um, we are part of a permaculture community um, and, and we do a lot of plant swapping and seed swapping so we're now at a point where if I can't grow something someone else can and we swap um, we share a lot of our knowledge between ourselves. We have um, uh, garden days where we help each other in our gardens. And so it's really lovely becoming part of a broader community uh, in that sense and sharing the knowledge as it becomes more and more um, popular to practice this type of gardening. So I make sure that um, the house and the garden are open as frequently as possible in different formal ways to large parts of the community so that people can get interested and that's resulted in you know schools coming and doing visits that are local um, and then taking bits away and um, you know using it in their school garden and doing beehives but uh, I think part of having a garden um, is sort of can be very lonely <laughs> but we've made it very much a social thing 
And the, the, the thing that was, well, the reason we chose permaculture was that when we moved in, our whole block was lantana except where the house was and camphor laurel and a whole lot of other weeds and pests. And we got some woofers in, we slowly cleared, it took about three months to clear the whole garden. Uh, and then we had this uh, um, huge big pile, it was about 10 metres long, uh, three metres wide and three metres high of mulch from that exercise. And that just sat at the very bottom of the garden for about three years and has eventually been used to build our garden bed. So we very slowly built the infrastructure in the garden as the, uh, the nutrients collected. And because of the difficulty in access and the steepness of the block, all the nutrients come in the top and nothing can come out again. So we're very careful about what we bring in <laughs> because we don't ever want to have to walk it back up the hill, but everything works its way down the hill from a nutrients perspective. So the things that need the most water and the most nutrients are at the bottom. So our zoning in, the, in a classical permaculture sense doesn't quite work, um, but we do um, have zoning, it's just that we have to work with the landscape. So that's it from us. Thanks, Selena. Um, and I might follow on your whole spiel about how it's um, connected you to community through food swapping and opening the garden to share knowledge is excellent. And it feeds right into um, the community garden who are also featuring in this session who are on next. Um, so Kim and Leah, would you mind introducing um, for a couple of minutes, um, the Lakeside Drive Community Garden, which is also in um, Alawa in Darwin. Hi, thanks, Lou. Um, I'm Kim and this is Leah and we're really excited to be re representing the community through the community garden on this session. Um, we're in Darwin, it's very hot here and the seasons are changing into the wet season. So there's a lot of challenges and with COVID and things, the guard, Lakeside Drive Community Garden, you know, is sort of amping up again with support of local funding and, and volunteers. So it's really exciting. Um, I guess, as a structure of a community garden, we rely heavily on volunteers um, and we try and generate a real community feel around the gardens um, through other sort of sub projects like arts projects. We've got a little gardeners group where zero to five year olds can come along and join in and we're promoting it because we're with CDU or Charles Darwin University. We're not far and we're linked with them. They're really encouraging students to get involved and connect with other people around the community through gardening and permaculture and learning new skills. And, um, you know, for learning skills, you know, universities are a great source of um, courses and education. So they're a really good place to start if you want to learn, you know, any of those skills for community gardening or gardening. Um, we also have the patch, which is a, a support special needs um, people. And we've just opened up some individual plots and group plots, which will be managed by the individual and harvested from the individual as well. Uh, a couple of other types of things we do on site are workshops. So we provide a lot of education. We link in with some great groups like Cool Mod and Environment NT to produce some really good workshops that educate people about the, you know, from harvest to cook to the table. And they're really popular and um, a great way to bring us together um, through gardening because that's what we're really focusing on is the well-being and the benefits to people getting involved and coming together as, in our community. Um, we also have, we want to encourage, you know, going back to basics as well and, and sharing knowledge and learning. So we're always crying out for volunteers um, in Darwin. And if you are interested in community gardening, get down because it's really great to have some good quality um, gardeners, you know, give a couple of hours a day to any community garden around Australia. So I'll hand over to Leah. Hi, I'm Leah Gill. Um, I've been connected to the Lakeside Drive Community Garden since it first started about 12 years ago. Um, we have over 70 species in our garden um, and we have a program whereby we're growing native plants as well. We are situated right next to a mangrove system so we're very careful about what we grow and, and where we grow it so that we don't impact negatively on the environment. Um, and we're very mindful of the fact that we have a lot of little um, native visitors to our garden. So we try and protect them and, and also provide food plants for them where possible. Um, the garden is, is thriving and, and will be 
beautiful during the wet season. It's a bit dry at the moment here um, and watering is always an issue. Um, but it's just going from strength to strength at the moment. We found with COVID there was a lot of lot more interest in sustainability here especially. Um, our food comes from a long way away. Um, we get most of our food trucked in. So um, the, the interest in sustainability has really peaked here at the moment, which is interesting and, and fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, and so we've only got about 20 more minutes to get through some questions. Um, so keep sending them through. And I guess something that's great to hear that you're all mm. using mm -hmm. in your gardens mm -hmm. um, is that you seem to all be using permaculture principles. Um, and, you know, a benefit of that is that you're quite in sync with your local climate um, and that this can also provide um, other additional benefits to these homes that you're living in through shading and sunlight and heat access in the different seasons of the year. Um, on that, and some questions that have come through is, uh, for the homeowners there, do you have different winter and summer beds to allow for fellow time um, and are you, yeah, so do you change things up depending on the season you're in or um, or rotate the beds or are you just letting it go all year round? We might start with Sue and Jay from the foot. Um, well, I do a bit of both really. Um, I, I do, I tend to grow, I, I tend to divide my, um, my vegetables into root vegetables, leaf vegetables and fruiting vegetables. The, the root vegetables I tend to grow separately in beds, um, carrots and leeks and no, carrots and parsnips and beetroot um, because they don't need much fertiliser. Um, we're in a, a warm temperate uh, Mediterranean climate so we can grow a really good range of things. I tend to grow my um, brassicas and uh, leafy greens together. They seem to go well together and they're, my, they're the staples for my winter garden. Um, and they will uh, just, when what, what I do is when I harvest a plant, I'll just pop in another plant and it can be either a, a leafy or a fruiting plant. The summer vegetables I'm a bit more careful with, especially with the, um, the uh, tomato family, eggplant, uh, eggplant and capsicums and tomatoes because of the danger of um, um, nematodes in the soil. So I tend to uh, rotate those around the four beds. And so I'll have one bed of, of the tomato family and then the other beds will be pumpkins and corn and cucumbers so that those four summer beds which are wicking beds they rotate around um, over four years so is, does that answer the question were there any more um, questions about that? well well whilst whilst you're speaking and before we go to the next garden we've had another question come through um, which relates to your wicking beds that you're talking mm -hmm. about and which, in your experience, which vegetables do you find grow best in wicking beds? Um, well, really any vegetable that needs, needs a lot of water in summer. I, um, uh, so definitely the tomato family because they, they're big plants and they have quite um, substantial roots that can reach down to the, the uh, wicking the water reservoir underneath. Um, basically, summer vegetables I find grow well. I don't, because we usually get quite a good rainfall in winter, I don't bother growing my winter vegetables in wicking beds. I, what I do is I try and extend my summer vegetables as late as I can, and then I'll put in a, um, a a green manure crop so that I prepare the soil for the next summer season. Does that Thank answer you. the question? 
Yeah, great. And um, so we might flick over to Karen now to see how you change up your garden depending on the seasons. And um, yeah, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, basically here in Melbourne, I'm in Melbourne, um, we basically very simply, we just avoid, avoid all kinds of brassicas in summer or uh, spring even. We try to plant all the brassicas in winter and or, we start to plant them in autumn and get them into winter because we get a lot of um, um, caterpillars here in summer. So that, that's what I find they grow best in winter. Apart from brassicas, the rest of the plants, um, well, of course the tomato we grow in summer as well, but apart from that, I kind of just grow random things throughout the year just to give myself a variety. Um, I tend to plant more variety of food than the same food in, in loads. Um, so I just spread some seed all over the garden and just let them let them grow. Yeah. But I, what I do though, I try not to plant the same thing in the same spot every single time because then every single plant takes different nutrients. So you want to rotate them around. But I don't have a fast rule. I don't have a rule around what to plant exactly when. Yeah. So. Right. And we had another question come through about your place as well. And um, this person was very impressed that you've done what you've done in nine months. Um, and they were wondering um, when you talk about what you harvest and how you chose what you started with, um, did you choose big trees to get established or were you just choosing quick producing items to get started and just getting yeah. used to I, it? I do both. So, when I first moved in here, obviously the soil was just completely barren. It wasn't good to plant. So the first thing we did was to fill it up with mulch, like about this thick, so across the whole garden. And at first when we pour water on the garden, it was just water would roll, roll over and it won't, won't absorb. It was that bad. So when we put the mulch over, then we started planting trees, fruit trees. And when we plant fruit trees, we tried to plant um, the, the miniature version, the dwarf version. So we don't plant big ones because we don't have a lot of space. So our little apple tree can produce heaps and heaps of apples. So you don't have to grow big trees in your garden, especially an urban garden. Um, so we firstly plant trees and then as we let the, the, um, the mulch and the tree mulch, when I say mulch, it's not the tree bark, it's the ones mixing with leaves and stuff, which is important, or grass clippings or whatever that is. Um, rot down a little bit, maybe a few months, I started planting vegetables and I basically have instant garden beds. So to plant them, you need to move the mulch away because you cannot plant into the mulch. You need to move the mulch away, make sure they plant into the soil. So you put some compost to backfill it um, and then we can have instant garden beds. And that's how, how I did my first garden, garden bed. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. And what about you, Selena? What are you doing um, on your property to mix it up between the seasons and ensure the soil quality is maintained across the garden? You're on mute. We live near the beach, so I get a little bit of seaweed um, whenever I can, and I make up a huge big barrel of sea leaf tea um, with some comfrey, and that fixes a whole lot of nutrients back into the soil. I also use volcanic rock dust um, and sprinkle it on the garden. I rotate um, crops through, but I never have any fallow time, um, so I'll alternate legumes in every bed of some kind um, at least once a year to fix nitrogen and then I get the potassium um, through the chook poo out of the chook pen so we deep mulch our chickens and then that gets redistributed over the gardens every season on my no dig beds I put a layer of uh, lucerne um, and a layer of uh, meadow hay um, and that also adds nutrients back into the soil. So um, just putting a huge variety of different uh, plant-based um, materials on um, and also that, that liquid um, fertilizer. And I also use that as a, fol a foliar feed on a lot of my plants. Um, we also have um, had other, so we live near um, a lot of people that keep horses and sheep. Um, even though we're in Sydney, <laughs> there just seems to be a few nearby. Um, and um, my kids think it's funny because people often will just drop a bag of poo at the top of the driveway for me. <laughs> and I'll go and 
sprinkle it on the garden. So we're very lucky that we have access to a lot of good nutrients. And so that means I, don't, I can just have stuff cropping all year round. And because we've got this really interesting microclimate, I can, I, there's some summer vegetables I can just grow all year round, even though it's Sydney. So I've got lettuce all year round and I've got, I can do zucchini and carrots and a whole lot of things all year round. So it's a, I've, I've decided that the European calendar doesn't work for us. I work to the Darawal um, six seasons um, calendar and I've sort of translated that out into um, uh, sort of how, what, how that approximates for different European plants. And it's also another reason why I'm swapping to a lot of indigenous plants and food plants, um, because I think that they're actually much more suitable for our site. Right, and when you mentioned microclimate, we had a question come through, which was, how do you um, find out what your microclimate is for some beginner gardeners on the call? And then you mentioned um, looking at the local Indigenous knowledge and their calendar. Um, is that kind of what you would recommend someone to do if they were looking to find out their microclimate? Yeah, that's like a, a really good way. But I mean, one of the best ways to do is to experiment and also to observe. So, but a big part of permaculture is just what looking, look what happens on that site. Um, so you might notice that one part of your garden's wetter than somewhere else. So you might have multiple microclimates through the garden, some shade areas, some mixed areas, some sunny areas, some well-drained, some less well-drained. Um, and if you can map that out, I think planning the garden is a really important thing and then being flexible enough to let go of that plan as parts of the garden change because the landscape is constantly changing in reality anyway. And as you build and grow your garden, you will impact other parts of that system. So there'll be more nutrients coming through or more water staying or leaving, depending on what you're doing elsewhere in the garden. So you need to observe what's going on and see what thrives and learn from that and, and adapt your planning and, and expectations from the garden. Through Thank you. That, that's really useful. And um, we might ask the community garden, um, what do you do um, to change up the seasons and let the ecosystem um, thrive and re-establish itself after a crop? We usually um, will use a green crop through the wet season, um, something like mung beans, um, any kind of bean to, to um, reinvigorate the soil. Um, we can only grow things like cucumber, tomato, capsicum, things like that during our dry season. So a lot of times um, those beds would lay fallow if we let them. So we can grow things like peanuts during the wet season. A um, lot of sweet potato we grow during the wet season to give us a cover crop and a, and a crop. Um, and yeah, just fertilise during that time. We fertilise um, every three months here um, because of the wet season drop. It kind of washes a lot of nutrients out. If, and if you do it all in one big go, just get no benefit from it. Um, but yeah, we just use a lot of mulch as well. We have to because during this time of year, it's so hot that if we haven't got a lot of mulch on our beds, any plants just get shriveled. Thank you. Um, did you have anything to add, uh, Kim? Or no, no, that's, that's you know, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Um, we do encourage people to bring mulch down to the gardens to add to our mul mulching. Um, sorry, mulch. So scraps and things like that for our compost to help build up our mulch. But we're a no dig um, garden as well. So everything sort of gets added on top. Um, so we're just- The soil yeah. is, it was horrifically hard. You could bounce a crowbar off it when we first started. So a lot of um, organic material and a lot of love and a lot of poo has gone into <laughs> it um, to make it work well now. If we had of um, dug, done, um, digging gardens it just wouldn't have worked out our, our soil is is like concrete to start off with oh sorry i'm on mute so we've only got about five minutes left um and so i would like to maybe go back to the footprint garden and um we've had some questions come through about 
you know, we've had so many people get more interested in gardening at home um, from COVID. And what can you recommend um, for beginners as something they can do to get started? And also, how do you deal with um, pest management in your garden? Okay, quick. <laughs> um, uh, a book I would recommend is by a local South Australian author called Lolo Hogan called One Magic Square and what she suggests you do, and this is how um, I, I teach this and, and so that lots of new gardeners are, are using this method, you start with one, one square metre of, of ground and you plant very, very um, densely um, the the plants seedlings that are suitable for that area uh, for that for, no sorry for the climate and for the season and you just look after those for a whole season and then when you fin when you've harvested your your vegetables you you um, increase your your magic square to two magic squares and so you start really small and you look after that small bed really, really well. And, and most people are really successful doing that. And then they, they learn so much and then they go on and become gardeners, veggie gardeners. And what was the other part of the question? The other part of the question was, what are you doing um, about pest management um, in your garden? Okay, I don't spray. Um, I tend to use uh, we have problems with um, cabbage white moth butterfly and I, I tend to net my garden uh, against those butterflies. Um, I use beer traps for snails um, and I also go out and crunch the snails at night, which is a good way to get rid of them. Um, and frustrations, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what else do I do? Um, um, because I have a very um, varied garden with lots of beneficial plants, I don't have much problem with with pests uh, at all. And I can and I I put up with the holes because you can eat the holes as well as the leaves. So um, yeah, so I just put up with some pest damage, but mm, I find that. Um, if you use, start using sprays, then you, you're also killing off all the beneficial insects um, that you need in your garden. Thank you. And um, Selena, you mentioned in your introduction um, that you use organic pest management um, methods. And if you wouldn't mind spending the last two or so minutes um, talking about what you do and weaving into your answer a question that came through about your garden, which is, is your garden your full-time job and how much time um, do you devote to your garden? I am a single full-time working mum uh, and it's too big for me and too physically difficult for me on my own. So I do use woofers, um, kids earn pocket money doing jobs um, and the permaculture garden allows you to have sections that just you don't touch at <laughs> certain periods of time. Um, and also, you know, being part of a community. So if we have everyone over here for a weekend and I cook a big pot of soup, we all work on it. And then we go do someone else's house another weekend. So that's a nice way to, to do it. Um, I use neem oil. It's about the only toxic thing that I use because like Sue and Jay, um, very careful about um, what goes into the environment because it leaches down into our local lagoon. Um, and I used to be on council and I used to have to tell everyone don't, don't use pesticides. So I had to do it myself. Uh, and um, so we have a lot of beneficial um, insects which have been attracted by planting beneficial plants. So I love my um, aphids and I love my lady beetles. I've got 26 different types of lady beetles that, that come to my house. I've got lots of wasps that are really um, are good at getting rid of pests. Um, and I've got um, the only thing that really troubles me is fruit fly, um, which I've just decided to get rid of the plants that get fruit fly and not try and grow them. And um, you learn that over time, I'm not going to be able to fix that problem. And I've got a problem with shield bugs. Um, so I have a battery operated um, rechargeable hand vacuum cleaner to get rid of those guys. 
Um, and then I just dump them in with the chickens and they eat them. Um, the chickens do a lot of pest management as well as do the dogs, um, which is kind of funny, but they really, really like to eat slugs sometimes and the, and the birds. So you just, I think you just need to, and you know, put up with them. They're part of the system. A lot of those pests are excellent pollinators and you want them around as well. And, you know, you don't want to be poisoning things because that poison goes into your soil and the food that you're eating. And we never, we don't need, we, we've survived for thousands of years without it. We should be able to continue in the future without it. Thank you. And Karen, did you have anything to add to that from your garden? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> uh, what do you do in your garden to overcome any challenges um, um, from pests or animals? Um, from pests, for me, the, the biggest problem I have is the, the cabbage moth. So I just don't plant them in summer and we don't get them in winter here. So we can still have beautiful brassicas in winter. So other pests, I don't, we, I don't have a lot of other pest problem so far. I don't know why that's the case, but we do have ducks that do some uh, snail control. But when it comes to snail, where we have section of the, the garden where the duck can't access, I send my kids there for snail hunting. Um, and they can keep the snails as pets. So that's how, how we manage that. Other than that, we don't have a lot of fun. Um, I think what I've, what I've learned is if your plant is healthy and if you give it the right nutrients, they should be able to fight off um, a lot of pests. That's how I understand it. Thanks. And um, Kim and Leah, did you have anything to add to that um, that you use in your garden? Um, yeah, we encourage birds to come into the garden because we've found that they're great little pest managers. And as for bigger pests, we've got um, a couple of large reptiles that live in our garden. So they take care of um, things that might come in and have a bit of a nibble. We've had um, a rabbit there at one point that someone dumped and he was having a lovely time and then disappeared. And I think he ended up um, in, a, in a big snake's belly. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we don't use sprays unless we have to, and then it's always um, organic sprays that won't hurt, hurt, hurt the other animals or um, our soils. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we've reached time, 3.40. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, remember you can go back to all the houses and the gardens profile on the website and ask any specific um, questions that we didn't get round to answering today and the homeowners can go back in there and reply to you. And thank you for our panelists for giving your time today and sharing your knowledge. Um, I'm sure so many people learnt lots of things to get them started or um, build on what they're already doing at their home. So thank thank you, Lou. Um, thank you to all our panelists. Um, we are going to have a short break and watch a video and then come back to a session on reducing construction waste, which I think um, anyone who has ever spent any time on a building site will um, be interested in. Um, it's emceed by Quentin Irvine, who owns the recyclable house in Beaufort, which is up on the website and he is also of Inquire Invent um, and the featured homes in the session are the NAAP home, uh, the SUHO type B 8.2 star home and the Candlebark house. Uh, so do stick around for that. It will start in two or three minutes and in the meantime we're going to watch a video.